What up, nerd? My name's Ryan. I did my HSE in 2019, and in this video, I'm going to go through projectile motion theory. This video is structured into three sections. The first one answering the question, what is a projectile? The second one being the required knowledge that you need to know before you do this topic. And then the third one being vector component analysis. So let's go. Okay, so first up, what is a projectile? Well, for the purposes of HC physics, a projectile is an object traveling freely through the air under the influence of, can you guess, gravity. So under the influence of gravity. Gravity is the only force acting on a projectile. So projectile is something that you, it's like an object, say this pen, that you launch, you throw in the air, it travels freely with the only force being gravity that is acting upon the object. So you can see that information in this diagram. You have a projectile represented by this uh, blue ball here, and it follows a parabolic path. So it follows a parabolic path. And at each point in the projectile's motion, it's being subject to acceleration due to the force of gravity, right? And the magnitude of this acceleration we generally assume to be 9.8 meters per second squared. And the projectile is being launched with some initial velocity u meters per second. So this is an initial velocity. And it's being launched at some angle theta to the horizontal. Some angle theta to the horizontal. So note that the acceleration due to gravity is in the vertical component, right? It's in the Y, it's across, it's like on the Y axis, right? There's no force acting in the horizontal component of the projectile's motion. It's only on the vertical component. And I said that usually it's negative 9.8 meters per second squared because there was a HSC question that is um, set on the moon and it gave you a different value for the acceleration due to gravity. So it's not always negative 9.8, but if you're not explicitly, if it's not explicitly stated otherwise, then you should assume that it is 9.8. So there are two assumptions that you make in HSC physics, right? Uh, the first assumption being that there exists a constant acceleration in the vertical in the vertical direction due to gravity. And then the second assumption is that there is no air resistance, right? What would air resistance be? Well, air resistance just means that as the object is traveling, as the projectile is traveling in this direction, say, it's experiencing a force due to the air that it's colliding with in the opposite direction. We ignore this for HC physics because it's it becomes too complicated. So yeah, these are the two assumptions. You won't get a question in the HSC that breaks either of these two assumptions. So some required knowledge now. Trigonometry is the first bit of knowledge that is really essential to um, doing this topic and really a lot of physics topics, right? And that's just your basic, here's a triangle, here's some angle theta. You're given this side as two, find this side, right? And you're just using Sokatoa. If you don't know what that means, it's just sine of the particular angle is equal to opposite over hypotenuse, cos of the particular angle is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse, tan of the particular angle is opposite over adjacent. And that will get you through uh, a large chunk of projectile motion questions. Like you need this as the starting off point. So if you're not solid on your trigonometry, I suggest you uh, revise it. I'm sure Eddie Wu has some videos on that. The other thing that you should at least be aware of is um, exact values. So it's not super important, but like I never I never memorized the exact values when I was in high school because you know you, you have a calculator, you can you can figure them out. But you should be aware that they exist because sometimes in your working you want to keep an exact value uh, rather than uh, rounding it off to a decimal because then you lose some accuracy in the final answer. So I suggest you be aware of uh, the presence of exact values. Okay, so vector analysis was one of the topics that you at least should have done in year 11, and that's where you're given some vector u, and you're tasked with breaking it into its x and y components. So it's x and y components, u of y here, and u of x here. And you're usually given some angle theta here, 
and you know given the val- given the value of u you need to find the values of u y and u x it's just a very natural consequence of using trigonometry and i'll show you an example of vector analysis within the context of projectile motion a little bit later next thing which is very essential is kinematics so this is also a topic that you did in year 11 and it's referring to these equations v squared equals u squared plus 2as v equals u plus at and s equals ut plus half at squared so a lot of teachers and tutors will recommend that you memorize these three equations i don't recommend that you me- memorize them because like i didn't know these equations off by heart until probably like halfway through year 12 and the way that you do it shouldn't be sitting down and looking them looking at them over and over again until you until they're ingrained in your mind. You should just do enough questions such that at the start of each question, it becomes natural for you to recall them. Like that's that's the way you should memorize them. I really wouldn't commit any time uh, to me- like just with the task of memorizing them because they're on your formula sheet anyway. And when you're in an exam, I don't know about you, but like even if I'm very certain about something, I'm still gonna check the formula sheet just to make sure. So it strikes me as like pretty meaningless to commit a significant amount of time to actually memorize them but you should do enough questions such that they become just natural to recall okay and the next piece of required knowledge is pythagoras's theorem so that's a squared plus b squared equals c squared where you're given a right triangle the hypotenuse is c and the other two sides are either a or b uh I don't know what to tell you if you don't know this already. <laughs> Good luck. Um, yeah, but anything here that you're you don't feel particularly comfortable on, I you need to like get solid at this right now if you're looking for high marks in physics because a lot of questions, a lot of quantitative questions, come back to these pieces of required knowledge, not just in pro- not just for projectile motion specifically, but especially throughout all of module five, you'll be using these as your bread and butter to answer every quantitative question and even some of the uh, qualitative questions. So now onto vector component analysis. Say you're given that a vector, a velocity vector has a magnitude of 20 meters per second with a angle to the horizontal of 30 degrees. And you're asked to find, firstly, you're asked to find U of X so first we employ trigonometry in order to think about, well, how is U of X related to the 30 degrees and related to the 20 meters per second here? So we know that cos, cos of a particular angle, in this case, 30 degrees, is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse. And in this case, the thing which is adjacent to the angle, the thing which is adjacent to the angle is u of x, the thing that we're trying to find. And in this case, the hypotenuse is this 20 meters per second here. So we write 20 meters per second in the denominator. Now we need to make u of x the subject of this equation here. And so we need u of x equals something. Well, what does it equal? Well, the only thing that we've got that is acting upon the u of x here is this divided by 20 term. So we want to do the reverse of that to get u of x on its own. So we multiply this side by 20. And if we do something to one side, we have to do it to the other. So we also multiply the other side by 20. And we're left with 20 times cos of 30 degrees. 20 times cos of 30 degrees. So I know that cos 30 is an exact value or it has an exact value. And I want to try and keep that exact value because it makes my final answer a little more accurate. So problem is, I don't remember what cos 30 is. And so how do I find what the exact value is? Okay, well, I'll teach you a little trick. You know, there's that one where you have like the two triangles and then, you know, you look at the sides and that's really gross in my opinion. And so the way that I do it is first think about cos 30, let like let cos 30 equal x, okay? And then if we go into the calculator and find what cos 30 is, we get this disgusting number. Okay, what happens if we square this disgusting number? Ooh, we get 0.75. So if we square both sides, right, cos 30 
squared is equal to x squared, which we found out is equal to 3 over 4, right, which is equal to 0.75. But I'll just look at it as a fraction. If we have that x is equal, or x squared is equal to 3 over 4, we can say that x is equal to the square root of 3 over 4. And the square root of 3 over 4 can be written as root 3 over root 4. And root 4 is 2. There it is. There's the exact value. And we know that x we let equal to cos 30. And so now we know that cos 30 is equal to root 3 over 2. Okay, so 20 times root 3 over 2. 20 times root 3 over 2. Let me just get all this out of the way. 20 times root 3 over 2. And that's just some basic math. And that's 10 root 3 meters per second. Not a lot of people, for whatever reason, use that trick. I, like, I didn't encounter anyone else in high school that used that trick. They just all memorized it, but my memory isn't particularly good, so I resorted to that. And I suggest you do too. Anyway, if you're having that problem. If your memory's great, then go ahead. Anyway, now to find u of y. How do we find u of y? Well, through a very similar process. So what is the relationship of u of y to this piece of data and this piece of data? Well, it's opposite to this angle 30 degrees here. And we know that this is the hypotenuse. So what's which uh, trigonometric function employs opposite and hypotenuse? So ka toa opposite and hypotenuse, that's sine. Okay, so sine of 30 degrees, sine of 30 degrees is equal to opposite over hypotenuse, which in this case is equal to u of y over 20. Okay, now we need to make u of y the subject of this equation. So u of y equals so what's happening to u of y? y? Right now it's being divided by 20, just like the last example. So we multiply this side by 20, and we multiply this side by 20, and we end up with 20 times sine of 30. Now, I know that sine of 30 is also an exact value. So what do I do? I go to my calculator, I clear it, I go sine of 30 is 0.5. So we got lucky this time, it's a very nice simple fraction, it's one over two. By the way, all the exact values that you should ever concern yourself with are either ones that can be represented as neat fractions here, or ones that are in a fractional form, but they have a certain in them, they have a square root in them somewhere. And if all they have is a square root, if you just square that, you can kind of work backwards and figure out what the square root is, like I showed you in the previous example. But this is simple enough, so we know that this is 10 meters per second. And then we might do a little concluding statement saying, therefore, u of x is equal to 10 root 3 meters per second. And u of y, and u of y is equal to 10 meters per second. And that's basically what vector component analysis is. So you need to understand what a vector is you need to understand that you can break a vector into its x and y components. You need to know trigonometry in order to figure out any unknown values that you need to figure out. You need to know how to make a variable the subject of an equation. So you need to be able to know how to make this the subject of the equation. So if this part felt dodgy for you, you should probably revise trigonometry. If this process here, the multiplying both sides by 20 felt dodgy, you need to revise the uh, the concept of making something the subject of an equation in math. We do, I think in, in uh, high school you do that in like year 10 or something. So go to Eddie Wu, I'm sure he's got a video on it. Um, and that's really, really important. I had friends that did physics that didn't know how to make something the subject of an equation, or they weren't very proficient at it. And it really took a toll on them later in the year because it's just, it's a very essential piece of math that you're gonna need throughout all of physics. So if any of that felt dodgy to you, like you will be saving yourself a whole load of trouble by like pausing this video right now, go learn, uh, like go revise trigonometry, go 
learn how to make something the subject of the equation, perhaps even go and review vectors. And only once you feel comfortable with those concepts would I continue learning through any of the uh, physics course because it's very, very essential. It's the bread and butter math that you're going to need throughout this entire course. Okay, so that was a brief introduction to the theory for projectile motion in HC physics. In the next video, I go through the three most common quantitative questions that you'll get on projectile motion, those being maximum height questions, time of flight questions, and horizontal range questions. And then down here, I've got a playlist with all the videos for Module 5 Advanced Mechanics. So good luck, and I'll see you in the next video.